Hi there, welcome back again. It's Rob Crisell and this is class number five out of six in my workshop, How to Read, Analyze, and Write Poetry. Today we are going to be talking about how to write a poem. So we're finally there. Some of you I know are gonna be very excited about writing your own poem finally. Having learned all these great things we've learned in the previous four sessions, some of you are gonna be you know, objecting and saying, ugh, Rob, I really do not want to write poetry. I would much rather just read it or, I don't know, watch TV. But writing poetry is wonderful. And even if you don't want to be a published poet someday, which would be very unusual, learning the process of how to write a great poem will help you in all sorts of writing, fiction and nonfiction, because you're using the same tools. But before I jump into that, let's briefly discuss what we already talked about in our previous sessions. Remember, we talked about what a poem is and what its purpose is to you and, and, and in general. We talked about the SMILE method. Remember that way of analyzing a poem? We analyzed a lot of poems. SMILE method, structure, meaning, imagery, language, emotion, SMILE. And then we analyzed a few poems, including um, the poem The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. I hope you enjoyed that. And I know that in Miss Angeli's class, you received poems, uh, maybe 20 or 25 poems, and analyzed one of them either with a partner or without, and hopefully you learned to read it out loud, squeeze the juice out of it, etc. And now you should be armed with all sorts of wonderful poetic techniques like metaphor and simile and personification and alliteration, assonance, consonance, anything else? Repetition, onomatopoeia, all those wonderful things and you're gonna be able to use those in your writing. Remember I told you the difference between reading a poem, which anybody can do, and reading a poem, squeezing the juice out of it, expressing it, taking that outstretched hand from that poet and grasping that hand and bringing that poet through his or her poem into your life. Well, there's also a similar distinction between writing a poem and writing a poem. Great writing is rewriting, all right? In fact, Ernest Hemingway, very famous author, he said, the only real kind of writing is rewriting. In other words, you might anybody can put words onto a piece of paper, but to really turn that into something memorable, lasting, and powerful, you need to revise it, edit it. You need to rewrite it. Okay, Blaise Pascal was a very famous mathematician, a philosopher, and a theologian back in the 1600s. He wrote a, in a letter to his friend, I'm sorry I wrote you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. Now, in the context of what we just said, talked about writing is rewriting, what is Pascal saying? Well, he's saying, I would have written you a concise, powerful, memorable, excellent letter but I didn't have time to rewrite it or edit it, so here are my ramblings. That's what he's saying. Great poetry is about the economy of language, using the best words and the fewest words. So this is true for nonfiction writing, fiction writing, letter writing, and above all, poetry. So before we start doing that, let's um, talk about how to write a bad poem. Because I figure if you know how to write a bad poem, you'll know what to do to write a good poem. At least you'll know what to avoid. Remember I told you poetry is like an iceberg. A poem is like an iceberg. A poem is also like a big, fat, juicy orange. We talked about that. Well, a poem is also like a pizza. Some people like thick crust. Some people like thin crust. Some people like vegetarian. Some people like a bunch of stuff on it. Some people like it from Pizza Hut or Domino's or Little Caesars. And some people hate those type of pizzas. So... Just because you don't like a poem or you write a poem that somebody doesn't like doesn't make it a bad poem. But we've all had bad pizza, right? Everybody's had bad pizza. Maybe it was in school cafeteria. Maybe it was some frozen pizza that your dad found in the back of the freezer and gave for you one night and it tasted like cardboard and it was disgusting. Okay, everybody acknowledges that there is such thing as bad pizza. Well, guess what? There is a lot of bad poetry out there. And if you wanted to write a bad poem, this is how you do it. Number one, don't revise your writing. We just talked about this, right? 
write something down really quickly, don't plan it, don't do anything, and then don't even revise it, or if, maybe revise it once or twice and then just hand it in to your teacher. Nobody writes well the first time they write. Almost nobody. Or if you do write well the first time you put something to pen, you're like, hey, that's a great poem. You're going to be able to make it much better if you revise it. Poetry is compressed, powerful writing. Think of that sculptor s sculpting a, a, a famous statue or a great statue. If they just hack away at it for a while, it's going to be terrible. They need to go back to it again and again and spend a lot of time shaping it, whittling it down until it's perfect. Example, this is a bad version of the poem. It's my first version. Tigers are so colorful, they glow brightly in scary jungles where they live, especially at night. Okay, not a great piece of poetry right there. In fact, it almost sounds a little more like some line from a, a bad short story. Let's try again. Tiger, you look like a hot ember in the dark forests where you live and sometimes even bark. Okay, it's definitely getting better. Now you're actually addressing the tiger. That's kind of cool. And you're comparing the tiger in this metaphor to a hot ember in dark forests. I kind of like that. I don't know why you would ever say that the tiger barks. I think you just wanted to rhyme with dark. So we got to revise again. Last one. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. Like it? Yeah, you should. That's a very famous first line by, by William Blake of, of, a, of his um, poem called The Tiger. And now you've got alliteration in there and the forest of the bright and the tiger, this very direct metaphor, the tiger's burning bright. Ooh, I like it. Okay, number two. If you want to write a bad poem, don't be specific in your writing. Be very general and generic and vague. Use vague language. Use abstract words that mean something different to every single person. For example, here's some abstract words. Beauty, liberty, happiness, love, sadness. Okay. Those words aren't bad. Beauty means a thousand different things to a thousand different people. But here's some concrete words. Orange, warm, cat, terror. Okay, these are specific enough words that they kind of mean something strong and specific and give you a, a very specific image. Let's, here's some examples of generic writing. I am heartbroken. His eyes shined like the sun. My tears were like raindrops. She was really sad. His eyes were brown. Outside, I heard a storm. Okay, some weak writing right there. Let's see if we can jazz that up. So right next to it, I'm putting the same version of that sentence, but making it a little more specific. My heart shattered like panels of glass broken by brute force. Not bad. His pale face reflected back the glow of the summer sun. The thunder teased her while rain and tears poured down. She was in agony. His eyes were chestnut brown. The rain wrapped madly against my window. Okay, see, now we're getting specific. We're using some language that is not just giving us a general idea, but, but getting a little more specific. All right, number three. Don't write with deep thought, planning, or feeling. Write your poem very quickly. Just get it over with. You know, write it, forget about it, put it in a drawer, hand it in to your teacher. Good poems always take time, hours, days, weeks. I have poems that I've written that have taken months. I come back to them again and again. I revise them. I look at them and say, what was I thinking, Rob? That is terrible. How could I have chosen that word, that image? And I change it up. So here's an example. Scribble down something and call it a day. It won't sound good or have deep meaning, but that's okay. Pretty rough, right? Lots of no good structure, not much of a beat, there's no images, and uh, call it a day is a cliche. Should have thought that one out. Number four, don't pay attention to form, including your stanzas, 
in li and lines. Remember, poems are not meant to be just listened to. They're not meant to just sound good. They're meant to have some meaning for you, either personal meaning or um, some sort of logic and thought that goes behind it. Most poems are not nonsense poems. Um, and they also are pretty to look at, usually. Most poets take time and make sure that their stanzas are where they want and the lines are fall where they want, etc. And there's all sorts of different wonderful poetic forms you can use. There's the sonnet, haiku, there's an acrostic, limericks, the epic poem, narrative poems that tell a story, couplets, and then of course there's free verse where there are no rules at all. Most poems today are free verse. Number five, don't pay attention to anything except rhyming. Rhyme all the time. Think about rhyme and only rhyme. Become obsessed with it. Does that sound like some of you people? Lots of children and children's poets, uh, po poets who write for children, love rhyming poetry. And there's nothing wrong with poetry that rhymes. I actually per per prefer it. You probably will too. But if you pay attention to rhyme and only rhyme, you're going to get some very bad poetry. Think of a Dr. Seuss poem. Not that Dr. Seuss poems are bad, but they tend to sound like nursery rhymes. And many Dr. Seuss books and poems are written for little kids. Here's an example from Hop on Pop. All tall. We all are tall. All small. We all are small. All ball. We all play ball. Ball wall. Up on a wall. All fall. Fall off the wall. Wow. A lot of rhyming. Was it a good poem? I don't think so. I think it was terrible, but it would be good for a four-year-old or a three-year-old or something. It sounds, it's all about the sound. Here's another bad example. That fat rat wore a bat hat. Then it sat on a mat. Okay, obviously I just went to a thesaurus or rhymezone.com, which you can find online, which is a great site. Uh, and I just looked up all words that rhymed with rat and I got fat rat, bat hat, does it make any sense? Is there a plan? No, it's all about the rhyme. And here's something from a very famous rapper called Soldier Boy. Rap is notorious for loving, loving, loving rhyme. And unfortunately, it creates lots of terrible poetry. Some of the worst poetry in the world is in the form of a hip hop song. And here's one of them. Ain't got time for chit chat. I'm trying to get this money. So get up out of my face, you doo doo head dummy. Okay, terrible poem, right? Doo-doo head, he had to, fit, you know, make sure that the beat all fits, so he put doo-doo head in there, and he rhymed money with dummy, which is a near rhyme, kind of a cheat rhyme, and he had to say ain't got time. You see that a lot in rap and in rock music where they use terrible grammar because to say I haven't got time for chit-chat, you're not going to fit that nice beat, so you end up sounding like, a bit of a moron. Number six, if you rhyme, make sure you force your rhymes. Forced rhyme is when is produced by changing the normal spelling of a word, creating bad grammar like I ain't got no time, or by changing the normal structure of a phrase. Here's some examples. Cat loved to play music and he loved to sing. To prove it to teacher, the bells he did ring. Okay, if your poem sounds like Yoda wrote it, you probably are using, trying to force that rhyme or trying to force that meter or rhythm too. I mean, why repeat love in the first sentence of that? Why wouldn't you have said, cat loved to play music and to sing? Well, because you wanted to fit those, those beats in there. And then who talks like that second line? The bells he did ring? I don't think so. Here's another one. Whenever we go out and walk, with you, I like to talk. Okay, you see things like this in lots of poetry where they rearrange the poem, like Yoda, and um, put the word that should have been earlier in the sentence at the end of the sentence. Because what would this have normally been like? I like to talk to you, or I like to talk with you. Instead, she reversed it and said, with you, I like to talk. Very awkward stuff. Here's another one. I like puppies. I think they're sweet. I have a brother. His name is Pete. You're going to be tempted to do this in some of your poems. Create random names. They obviously probably do not have a brother named Pete, 
and they just needed to rhyme with sweet. And what does the brother have to do with the puppies anyway? Come on, try again. Last one. As I was walking down the road, I was looking for some shade so that I could put down my load. What's wrong? Well, one line has eight syllables and a very distinct iambic rhythm, which we talked about before. As I was walking down the road, remember iambic is that de dum, de dum, de dum, the heartbeat rhythm. As I was walking down the road, nice, eight beats. But the second line is all over the place. It's got 15 syllables, 15 beats, and its rhythm is not iambic, it's random. I was looking for some shade so that I could put down my load. Ugh, awful. Number seven, focus on adjectives rather than verbs. Now, we all like adjectives. There's nothing wrong with an adjective, but adjectives and intensifiers and modifiers are a sign of weak writing. Here's some examples. He's running fast. He's sprinting. Running fast, sprinting. Just use one word that's very powerful rather than running fast. I heard a loud sound. Hmm. I heard a racket. Okay, that's a very evocative word. It tells you exactly what it is. You don't have to use an adjective and or, or, or an adverb and the adjective. The house is very big. Okay, that's how you'd write if you were in third grade, or I guess if you were writing an email to your friend. The house is enormous, okay, or gigantic, or immense, or colossal. Those are juicy, delicious words, right? Batter went all over the fluffy cat. Batter splashed all over the cat. Lightning suddenly made the darkness super bright. Super, very, those are modifiers. You don't want to use them in your writing generally. Lightning shatters the darkness. Compact, powerful. Number eight, don't use figurative language. Remember all the figurative language we learned? Personification and similes and metaphor and alliteration, assonance, repetition. Don't use any of that. It's too much work. Don't weave in poetic elements and tricks. Just make it as boring as possible. For example, the sky looked big and filled with stars. The night was dark. It was very dark. The ground was cold under his feet. He walked through the tall forest. Okay, very simple, straightforward, not very interesting, not really worth writing down in the first place. The stars are mansions built by nature's hand. The winter evening settles down with smell of steaks in passageways. Crisply the bright snow whispered, crunching beneath our feet. I stood still and was a tree amid the wood. Some famous examples. Number nine, don't use imagery. Similar to what we just talked about. Great poems create images speaking pictures that we talked about. And the best poetry usually stimulates one or more of the six senses. Um, sight, hearing, smell, touch, taste. Number 10, if you want to write a bad poem, use cliches. Use lots of idioms and trite phrases. Remember what a cliche is? A cliche is like, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. Or I'm starving to death. Those are all trite phrases that are either metaphorical or have been in our language forever and ever. So here's some cliches. The park was covered in an ocean of grass. He saw two bears, dark as midnight. He was cool as a cucumber, even though the sun was hot as fire. Okay, we all use cliches and this sort of lazy writing every single day, but when it comes to your poetry, you need to go and do a a search and destroy of your cliches and bad writing. Number 11, don't write concisely with as few words as possible. Bad poems often sound like short stories with long wordy descriptions. And when I teach fourth and fifth graders, they actually look like short stories because they haven't written a lot of poems. You seventh, eighth high schoolers, 
You know better. Poems look like poems most of the time. This is a poem that was written by a, a fifth grader at a local school. And he said, can I write a poem on Minecraft? And I said, absolutely. You love Minecraft? That's your passion? Write me a poem. This was his poem. You can build any you want to castles, to dirt houses, and you can survive, or you can create maps for other players to play. You can also mine for jewels. All right. That's not exactly a poem, is it? Or you could say it is a poem but it's a bad poem. It's really just a little short story he told me about Minecraft. Poems, you need to err on the side of minimalism. Once you've got a draft, and say that draft of your poem, that first draft is 50 words, your goal should be to try to get it down to 40 words, get it down to 30 words. Each word should be heavy with emotion and meaning should be absolutely essential. Number 12. You want to write a bad poem? Write about something you don't care about and do it in the most plain, boring way possible. Great poets renew the language. So when you sit down to write your poem, make it new. Your strength is the ability to see what other people see every day, but in a new way. You take the ordinary and you turn it on its head. So write about something you care about. It doesn't have to be a deep, meaningful poem. It can be funny, but you want to make it different. You want to make it new, bring it to life. Number 13, don't read your poem out loud. Almost every great poet who's ever lived knows that poems are meant to be read out loud. And when they are writing their poem, at the very least, they are reading that poem out loud to themselves all the time. Why? Because yes, we get information through our eyes into our brain, we also get it through our ears into our brain. And if you never vocalize your poem, you're not going to necessarily hear how good or bad it sounds. Here's an example. I like to run. I like to play. I like running around every weekend. Okay, it doesn't rhyme, and that's okay. But you can see right away those two lines need work. The first one has eight beats, a nice, smooth, iambic meter. I like to run. I like to play. And then the second one has 10 beats and an ugly, messy meter. I like running around every weekend. Ba 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 da ba ba. Okay, you need to clean that up. And you're not going to necessarily know that unless you read it out loud. Here's another one. We rose through April afternoons. Then we went back down to earth in late June. Ugh. Again, seven nice beats in that first, um, in that first line. And then a really ugly, uneven meter that barely rhymes in the second line. And right there on the board next to me now, I'm showing you the things that you need to do to become great writers. Not just great writers of poetry, but great writers of anything. Before we meet again for our final class, class number six, I want you to write a poem. I want you to use all the techniques and all the, the things that you've learned over the last five sessions and write your own poem. What I'll do is you can turn those poems in and I will analyze them and read some of the best ones in our next class together. But I want you to set a timer for five minutes, brainstorm, and I want you to write for about 15 minutes or so. I want you to take a break, walk away from your poem, clear your head, and then come back and do that all-important um, thing that all great writers must do, which is to rewrite, to revise, to edit, and then I want you to send it to me through your teachers or via my email that you can find online. I hope you learned something about how to write bad poetry. We don't want to write bad poetry, though. We're going to write good poetry. So I will see you next time, and until then, adios.